your title to read. All right, and our last speaker today is um, Eric, and he's going to present the UZ's uh, note. Thanks. <clears throat> Fundamentally, at the heart of HCI are users. Uh, now, this may not be your, your prototypical user, but HCI's developed methods of designing for all different types of users. Put concisely, a user is an individual or group who uses a software product to perform a specific function and benefits from a system during that functioning. In many ways, users are the raison d'etre of HCI as a discipline. In just the past couple years, though, we've seen the emergence of a line of research building on the work in the sociology of technology that studies non-users, those individuals who, for various reasons, might use a technology but don't. Such work has helped advance the ways that we account for people who don't use technology. Thus, HCI has reasonably well-developed conceptual vocabularies for dealing both with users and with non-users. However, there may be other configurations between those two poles that don't fit cleanly into either category. So consider the following two examples. First, there's an iPhone app called Girls Around Me that shows photos from public profiles of Foursquare users who have recently checked in nearby. By default, it shows only female users, but you can configure it to show only male users or both if you so choose. Uh, if a Foursquare user has linked his or her Facebook profile, it also shows information from that account full name, birth date, relationship status, and any other public photos. Uh, as you may expect, the reaction of the popular media to girls around me characterize it largely as, quote, a hookup app for potential stalkers and date rapists. This negative press coverage led Foursquare to revoke the app's API access, uh, cause effectively rendering it non-functional, which resulted in the developers pulling it from the app store. Now, the story around this app raises numerous issues dealing with privacy, surveillance, gender, personal data, corporate responsibility, individual responsibility, and others. Indeed, there's some prior work by Jackson et al. who have used girls around me as a case study to engage with some of these issues. Here, I want to use it as an example to consider some of the problems that it poses for our category of the user. Specifically, how does HCI discourse account for the women and men whose information is displayed in this app. They don't really fit the, they don't really use the app to perform a specific function or benefit from the app during its usual, utilization, making it hard to call them users. But classifying them as non-users proves similarly unsatisfying. They indeed have some type of relationship with the technological system, but our current vocabulary falls a little short in articulating the nature of that relationship. Now I want to consider a second example. <clears throat> Marketers often argue that many daily purchasing decisions are made largely out of habit. However, these habits become open to change around certain pivotal life events, such as moving house, getting married, or notably, having a baby. To gain a competitive edge, analysts at the retail corporation Target used customers' purchasing history to predict not only when a customer was pregnant, but even identifying her due date. Doing so then allows, ta allows the, the corporation to tailor and target uh, the ads that are sent by mail, postal mail, to the customer. Uh, in one instance, a man voices dissatisfaction when his daughter, in high school at the time, received such tailored coupons. Uh, she's still in high school and you're sending her coupons for baby clothes and cribs, he said. Are you trying to encourage her to get pregnant? Uh, soon thereafter, though, the same man again contacted his local target uh, because, as it turned out, his daughter was, in fact, pregnant. Uh, so we see here similar issues related to privacy, gender, modernism, corporate marketing strategy, etc. But again, I want to ask, how does HCI account for the woman whose pregnancy was identified? Once again, it's not really clear that the category of user or the category of non-users seems particularly apt here. So these two cases really demonstrate a gap in our current vocabulary. So to fill this gap, this, this note suggests the term UZ 
to designate this kind of liminal space in between use and non-use, where a person is, in at least some sense, used by a computational or technological system. And so drawing from these two examples, I want to suggest three attributes that define what counts as a UZ. First, a UZ is explicitly targeted by a technological system. This means that the system leverages some sort of representation of the individual. For example, target stores maintain a database of unique guest IDs, which becomes the basis of their, their mining analyses. As a corollary, not everyone affected by a technology should be called a UZ. For instance, uh, handrails on staircases can influence perceptions of safety, but the handrail doesn't really maintain any representation of the stair climber or their perceptions. Second, a UZ has limited awareness of a system, its function, or the fact that she or he is being targeted. While the Foursquare users were likely aware that they were sharing their location publicly, although perhaps not, uh, most were unaware of the ways in which those data were being aggregated and redeployed. Importantly, awareness can happen in degrees. For instance, customers may have a, a peripheral awareness that stores are collecting data about them, but as analysts from the Target Corporation put it, quote, as long as a pregnant woman thinks she hasn't been spied on, as long as it doesn't spook her, it works. This limited awareness becomes a key to the system functioning as intended. Third, the system does things with a UZ's data to which he or she did not knowingly consent. Admittedly, we can't really infer whether every Foursquare user would consent to their data being used in the way that the girls around me app did, but we can know that such an extent was neither sought nor given. So to wrap up, I want to suggest two important implications of this articulation of the, the concept of UZs. First, the two examples that I've presented here are somewhat sensationalized, but examples of UZs can really be seen in much more quotidian contexts. For instance, search engines may use individuals' browsing history to optimize query results. Social media platforms leverage user behavior to automatically curate content. Uh, healthcare providers might mine individual data to develop customer incentive programs that, uh, that encourage seeking preventative care. Future research should consider whether and how the concept of UZs applies to a variety of such situations. Second, the notion of UZ represents but one potential configuration among many that sit uncomfortably between the extremes of user and non-user. Drawing on work in the philosophy and socio sociology of technology around agency, power structures, the nature of technological experience will really prove crucial in developing an analytic vocabulary that lets us articulate these novel emergent subject positions. Not doing so risks leaving us with an incomplete and inaccurate understanding of how exactly HCI technologies affect and are affected by the social worlds in which they are enmeshed. So really quick, thanks to the NSF for supporting this work, uh, folks who read and commented on previous drafts, and all of you for your time and attention.